And so now let's meet Dr. Joe Sertich. And I'm so excited to introduce him today. He is curator, curator of dinosaurs at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Joe is from central Iowa. He grew up in the Denver area where he pursued his passions for paleontology from a young age, taking courses and volunteering at the museum through high school before pursuing a professional career in paleontology at Colorado State University. His research focuses on dinosaurs and their ecosystems during the late Cretaceous um, stage. Joe works in the field in addition to the museum. He is one of the primary researchers on the Madagascar pa Paleontology Project, exploring the Cretaceous of Madagascar. He's also working on several projects, including the first latest Cretaceous dinosaurs of Africa, including work in Northern Kenya. Closer to home in the Rocky Mountain West, Joe leads the Laramida, I'm sure I've got that wrong, project, mm -hmm currently leading research to uncover a lost world of dinosaurs in the Cretaceous of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. These efforts have combined to produce dozens of new dinosaur discoveries and other vertebrates from the Meso Mesozoic in, per in pursuit of patterns of ecosystem evolution in response to large-scale earth processes, including cli climate change and tectonics. With that, welcome Dr. Joe. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to Rotary. Rotary has a, a special place in my heart, um, going all the way back to when I was a graduate student working in Madagascar. Uh, we worked with several Rotary groups to bring uh, clean water and health missions as part of our dinosaur research there. So Rotary is a really a special organization to me. Um, today, I'm gonna share some slides with you. Let me load this up. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, uh, I've been at the Denver Museum now for about 10 years. Uh, it'll be 10 years this coming May. Uh, and during that time, um, we built a really uh, vibrant dinosaur program looking all around the American West for new discoveries. So I hope the, the takeaway today is that uh, there are a lot of dinosaurs still out there. In fact, many of them are literally under our feet here along the front range of Colorado. And um, if you have kids or grandkids and they want to be paleontologists, you can tell them that they don't have to worry. I haven't found all of them. There's still plenty more out there to, to dig up. So in fact, uh, where we are situated here on the Front Range sits almost exactly in the middle of this oval, which encompasses most of the uh, Western interior of North America, where I would argue at least half of what we know about Earth history uh, falls inside of this oval. So all of the discoveries from the Ice Age back to some of the earliest fossils in the fossil record billions of years old fall within this. And in the 10 years I've been at the Denver Museum, we've been lucky enough to do uh, exploration of all of these different areas highlighted by yellow stars. And so each of these different stars is a different field project, a different discovery. Um, I would say this is uh, an underestimate of the work that we're doing right now at the Denver Museum. And if we include our partners at places like CU Boulder and Colorado State University and other regional institutions, this triples or quadruples in numbers. So a really great place to be centrally located if you want to look at dinosaurs. And when we talk about dinosaurs, we're talking about what's called the Mesozoic. So if you look at the top of the screen here, there are three different time units I've highlighted, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. And all of those are a big part of the age of dinosaurs. You could argue that dinosaurs uh, survived and are still alive today and we're still in the age of dinosaurs with all of the birds, the amazing birds we have around us. And I know that one of the recent speakers talked about bird song, so think about that as dinosaur song. Um, and each of these arrows that's pointing to the age of dinosaurs are really important windows that we have here in Colorado and mostly here along the Front Range. If we talk about the earliest dinosaurs, at least here in Colorado, we do have one window. This is up in the Eagle Basin, so near Eagle, Colorado, where new discoveries are constantly being made. And some of those are brand new species of crocodile relatives. So the upper right is a crocodile relative that's a, probably a plant eater, early salamanders, and then the early dinosaur-like animals in the upper left um, are recently being described and discovered near Eagle. But I'm not going to focus on that for today's talk. Today, I'd like to focus on the Jurassic, which is probably Colorado's 
biggest historic claim to fame in dinosaur paleontology. And then we'll move into the Cretaceous with some of our recent discoveries at the Denver Museum. So the Morrison dinosaur discovery back in 1877 really can be pointed out as the, the launching point of discovery in the American West. So Arthur Lakes, who was a part-time professor at the Colorado School of Mines, was hiking in the hogbacks just west of Morrison um, near, near Golden. And he discovered these big fossil bones just laying out on the surface. So you can see this excerpt from Scientific American in 1878 with an artist's reconstruction of what that discovery looked like. I doubt they were quite that obvious, at least as gigantic bones. But this really kicked off the age of dinosaurs in the late 1800s. And in fact, the, the formation that contains these late Jurassic dinosaurs is known from across the Rocky Mountain West, from southern Montana all the way into Oklahoma, northern New Mexico, and even northern Arizona. So it's a really wide, expansive formation. But we have some of the best locations for Morrison formation dinosaurs or Jurassic dinosaurs right here in Colorado. So that includes places like Dinosaur National Monument up in northwestern Colorado. Uh, probably the most famous for dinosaur paleontologists is an area called Garden Park, which is just north of Canyon City in central Colorado. And then some amazing discoveries still coming out of Morrison and western Colorado uh, near Fruta and Grand Junction. In fact, if you come to the Denver Museum, you'll see this pair of dinosaurs fighting. Uh, these individuals are from opposite sides of the state but they do represent a good uh, idea of what the dinosaurs from this time period were. And that includes our state fossil, Stegosaurus, so the armor-plated dinosaur on the right, and Allosaurus, the big carnivorous dinosaur. Uh, the Allosaurus on the left was found um, by a current Boulder resident, India Wood, when she was uh, a teenager up in northwestern Colorado. So it's a cool local discovery. Uh, we're still making new finds from the Morrison Formation, so even though the, the Morrison has been dug since 1877. We're still finding new fossils. In fact, one from our collections that's been sitting in a, a back drawer recently came to my attention. So this is a dinosaur called Marchosaurus. It's known only from a couple of upper jaw bones. They're not very descriptive there. But in comparing those bones to the fossil I found in our drawers, this is a, a meat-eating dinosaur. This is its skull. I can say with pretty comp high confidence that we have a brand new species of meat-eating dinosaur that came from the dinosaur area. So there's still new species of dinosaur coming out of the Morrison Formation here in Colorado. And we're working with other partners who are digging in this time unit up in Wyoming and, and other parts of the Rocky Mountain West. So lots of new discoveries to come from the Jurassic. But I really want to focus today on the Cretaceous. So the Cretaceous period is that last window into dinosaur evolution and dinosaur time. It's really interesting. Uh, from a modern perspective, because the Cretaceous is where many living groups, things like flowering plants, birds, turtles, crocodiles that we still have around us today, got their start. So think about the Cretaceous period as the time when dinosaurs lived in a more modern world. And a lot of the things that you'll see in these background paintings should be familiar to you, at least if you've ever spent time down on the United States Gulf Coast or in other subtropical areas of, of the world, if you've ever gone on vacation to places like Jamaica or Mexico, they, they might look familiar to you. To kick off Colorado's Cretaceous story, we have to go back to 115 million years ago. This is a time when an interior seaway covered most of the central part of North America, including major parts of, of Colorado. In fact, the rocks that Boulder sits on, the city of Boulder itself, are from the bottom of the seaway. So there are lots of issues probably with shales and shrinking and swelling of clays. Those were shales that were deposited, muds that were deposited at the bottom of this big seaway. But at the edge of the seaway, there was a really cool beach environment where we get dinosaur trackways. So a lot of you may be familiar with the dinosaur trackways at Dinosaur Ridge, which are highlighted here um, down southwest of Golden, Colorado. And there are also trackways like this all the way up into Boulder. In fact, this summer I met with the Boulder um, Open Space and Mountain Parks people because they were finding dinosaur tracks from this exact same rock unit just over by El Dorado Canyon. So these rocks are all around us. If you hike up onto the hogbacks regularly, be on the lookout for three-toed tracks like this. They're, they were made mostly by uh, small meat-eating dinosaurs and plant-eating dinosaurs, 
um, called iguanodonts, so two-legged plant-eating dinosaurs. We don't have a lot of actual fossils from this time period. In fact, the only one that's named from Colorado from this time period was found down in the Garden of the Gods. Um, and it's a, a plant-eating dinosaur that probably made these big three-toed tracks. But to really dig into new discoveries, we have to zoom all the way forward to 66 million years ago, the end of the time of the dinosaurs. So this is the last dinosaur ecosystem here in the Rocky Mountains. And many of you might be familiar with this time period because this is when really famous dinosaurs like T-Rex and Triceratops roamed most of the Rocky Mountain West. So here's a picture of a T-Rex eating some gross dead dinosaur in the middle there. Um, and this is the time period of T-Rex from places like Montana, the Dakotas, Wyoming. And I would argue that the record we have here along the Front Range from southeastern Boulder County all the way down to Colorado Springs is one of the best places in the world to look at this dinosaur ecosystem right before the extinction of the dinosaurs. This is a painting, I'm sharing this for the first time publicly. This is a painting we just had finished. This is based on a discovery from Littleton, Colorado of a T-Rex. So this is the Littleton T-Rex. And if you look in the background, hopefully my cursor shows up, these are the early Rocky Mountains. And then these big storm clouds are forming over that seaway um, north of Boulder and uh, out to the east, eastern plains. Um, so this is what Colorado would have looked like right around 66.1 million years ago, very precise. And this is what the Denver area looks like today. So the different color bands you see in this image are different rock units. Uh, the orange and the chocolate brown colors represent this time period. And the squiggling pink line that you see moving through the middle of the brown is a very precise line that indicates when dinosaurs went extinct. So the Denver Basin is what we call this. And the Denver Basin contains the best record of this extinction event anywhere in the world. And we can just go right outside of Denver or right outside of Golden and look at dinosaurs right before the extinction event. Uh, if you go inside of that pink line, so the center of this onion, then you're in the time period right after dinosaurs go extinct. And we have amazing discoveries that we're working on right now from places like Colorado Springs and Golden and even out in the Eastern Plains near Straussburg, Colorado, where we're looking at how life recovered after the dinosaurs went extinct, after a huge asteroid hit off the coast of Mexico and obliterated more than half of life on Earth. So we have this a really amazing record. In fact, uh, these are some of the discoveries we're making from Colorado Springs. Uh, several of my colleagues here at the museum are leading this research after the dinosaurs looking at things like early mammals, early turtles, and early crocodiles as they filled in the, the roles that dinosaurs used to play in the ecosystem. But we're going to focus on dinosaurs because that's my favorite. So here is a schematic of Denver itself with some of the more important historic discoveries highlighted as little dinosaur icons. This includes dinosaurs literally from backyards. So I mentioned the Littleton T-Rex. This is a discovery that was made in 1992 at a housing development. So you can see literally in the backyard of this house is a T-Rex skull and skeleton. Um, we've recovered so far parts of the leg, arm, teeth, tail. And what's really interesting is they had to quickly close this site. And based on what we have in collections, I'm pretty confident that this person, whoever ended up buying the house or whoever currently owns the house, has a T-Rex sitting in their backyard that they don't know about. So someday we're gonna have to go knock on the door and, and offer to put in maybe a swimming pool or something and look for that T-Rex skull. Um, so like I said, there's literally dinosaurs in backyards here in Colorado. By far the most common types of fossils we find in the Denver area, the Denver Basin, are horned dinosaurs. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of those finds because uh, they're historically important and because um, they're really teaching us about uh, some of these really important horned dinosaurs and how they lived here in the Rocky Mountain West. So the first one I want to highlight is that first icon to the left, right next to the, the D for Denver. So right in the city center was the very first horned dinosaur ever discovered, the top of the head of what's now recognized as a triceratops. But back when it was discovered in the late 1870s, it was thought to be a strange form of bison. So it was actually named bison altacornis, which means the tall horned bison, because at that time we had no idea what a horned dinosaur was. 
So if you imagine a world in which we don't know what a triceratops looks like and you discover these gigantic horns, the most relevant thing in, in your imagination would be a, a cow or a bison. And that's exactly what early scientists thought this was. Since then, we've made a lot of other discoveries, mostly on housing developments and construction projects. This is a skull of a triceratops dinosaur that was found in Brighton, Colorado. So the upper right hand icon on this map. This was found in 2003 by a bulldozer driver who basically drove and cut the skull right down the middle. So it's half of the skull uh, was, was saved and preserved after the bulldozer operator realized that he had hit a, a dinosaur skull. This is a dig that we did in the summer of 2019, so about a year and a half ago. This is down right on the, the edge of Chatfield Reservoir in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Um, this was the site of a um, retirement community construction project. And they hit a dinosaur right on the very edge where it abuts a golf course. And so one of the big challenges of this site you can see here in the middle is there was tons of water constantly flowing through the site because they kept watering that that golf course right next door so we were constantly battling uh, waterfalls and flowing water as they washed through the site but we ended up collecting the most complete triceratops specimen ever found in colorado um, this is a, a drawing of the portions that we have preserved the orange parts are the parts of the skeleton that we know that we have and as we clean these blocks it takes several years to clean the rock off of them we continue to add orange bones to this diagram. So already it's the most complete and it's only becoming more and more complete as we clean more of the skeleton. And then finally, you probably noticed that one of these icons is orange. And this is a discovery made in late 2017, uh, also a construction project. This was for a public safety facility, so police and fire. And one of the construction workers noticed this little collection of uh, strange rocks in the center of one of their pylons. And so they had just drilled in, you can see it behind this gentleman here, there's a pylon that went in. They drilled right through a dinosaur site and it turned out to be the most complete skull and partial skeleton of this really rare dinosaur called Taurosaurus. So from the front of the eyes forward, Taurosaurus looked very much like a Triceratops, but the back of the skull is quite different. And we recovered by far the most complete skull, but also most of the front half of the skeleton of a new Taurosaurus, so the most complete dinosaur ever found in the Cretaceous of Colorado. And it was right here in a construction project. Right now we're piecing this, this Taurosaurus together. This is at a lab fabricator out in Fruta, Colorado. And we're planning to have this full displayed dinosaur um, for the first time starting in about a month. So we're gonna unveil Tiny the Taurosaurus, that was what it was named, um, at a museum exhibit that starts in mid-February. So if you're interested in seeing what this dinosaur looks like, you'll have opportunities hopefully coming up in the spring. So if you look, the, the snout is to the left, there are big horns over the eyes, and then that big sweeping portion of the skull to the right is the frill, the shield. And if you compare that to a triceratops, triceratops here on the bottom, that's the main feature that's different. Triceratops had a solid frill, and Taurosaurus had a very wide, thin uh, frill that had big windows through the bone, windows that wouldn't have been um, noticeable in life. In fact, this is a recent reconstruction of the Thornton find that we just got hot off the press. So again, it looks a lot like a Triceratops, except it has a different shape of that frill or the shield behind its head. And so this is a reconstruction of what Thornton would have looked like uh, 66.2 million years ago. So very close to the time of the Littleton T-Rex. And then the last one from here in Colorado I wanna highlight is a, a discovery that we made up in Northern Colorado back in um, one of the public, or not, yeah, in one of the public buildings. And so a dinosaur had been discovered in the late, uh, or sorry, the early 1980s. It was a Triceratops found near Briggsdale, Colorado. And it ended up being donated to Weld County and it has sat for almost 40 years now on display in Weld County, but it was completely inaccessible to scientists. In fact, most of the scientific community didn't even know it existed because it never was formally accessioned into a museum collection. And so we've been working closely with Weld County. Uh, the County Commission has been really gracious and really helpful in letting the Denver Museum um, accession the specimen. We're also cleaning the specimen. 
this is what the fossil looks like. It's the major part of a skull and parts of the, the body. And what's really interesting about this discovery is it's much older. So when we think about the rocks around the Denver area and the Front Range, we usually think about dinosaurs in what's called the Denver Formation. So this green rock unit right before dinosaurs go extinct. But parts of Northern Colorado and even Eastern Boulder County contain a rock unit called the Laramie Formation, which is closer to 69 or 70 million years old. And we think that this skull came from very old rocks, which makes it the oldest known uh, Triceratops anywhere in the world. And in fact, some features of the skull show that it's probably not a Triceratops, it's probably another type of dinosaur uh, known from only a single broken skull up in Canada called Eotriceratops. So we probably have the best skull of an Eotriceratops found right here in Colorado. Uh, this is work that we're still doing in the Laramie Formation. This is southeastern Boulder County. We were out there last winter walking around. And believe it or not, just off of Wadsworth, there are big chunks of horned dinosaur skulls just eroding out of the ground. So here's my rock pick next to what looks like a pile of gravel. And this gravel is actually a pile of bones, probably from another horned dinosaur. You can see some of the shopping centers and restaurants down here uh, just off Highway 36 in Wadsworth. So this is just right off of Wadsworth. Uh, in fact, most of eastern Boulder County has rocks of this age. So it's an area where I plan to be working for the next several years looking for more discoveries from this really important time window into the time of dinosaurs. I have a ton more to talk about, but I know that you guys probably have questions. We're doing a lot of other work in uh, slightly older rocks all around the American West. That includes places like Utah and New Mexico, where we have at least another 12 new species of dinosaurs coming out of the ground or in various states of, of reconstruction and discussion. So I don't want to take all afternoon talking about dinosaurs, because I know that you probably have questions about some of the discoveries that we're making uh, closer to home here in Colorado. So with that, I'd like to end and open it up to questions. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so before we get into the first question from Mero, I just have one. Uh, if our members wanted to learn more about this, uh, I assume they'd go to the, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I was just wondering if you could expect, you know, let us know what to expect. I mean, what's the experience life like in today's COVID world? Yeah, so we've been open since uh, late June at the Denver Museum. Um, it's just timed tickets, so you have to go online and reserve a spot. And when you show up, you're able to move around just like you would anywhere else. It's actually quite safe given how gigantic our building is um, and the capacity numbers are set pretty low. And so I have found it to be a, a pretty safe experience if you come in, you hardly see anybody else. Um, and you can enjoy almost all of the same things that you would have enjoyed before. So um, sometimes our, our theaters are open I think right now, now that we're at uh, Colorado level orange, we reopened our theaters, but you can still go into all the exhibits. You can still see what we're doing in our prep lab. So you can see some of the fossils, including that Weld County skull right up in the front window. Great, thank you very much. Okay, our first question goes to Merrill. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Merrill. I'm unmuted, Mike. Um, and, and Joe, thanks so much for speaking to our club. Much appreciated. I wanna say, a lot, like a lot of kids, I loved reading about dinosaurs. In fact, it hurt me more to have Brontosaurus removed from the species list than it did Pluto removed as a planet. So I would give you an idea of my emotional there. Um, my question is about a paleontologist who changed my views about dinosaurs forever. Uh, Robert Bakker, uh, he's a pioneer, I hope I pronounced that right, is a pioneer who shaped many of our views about dinosaurs today. So my question is, I wonder if you could comment on Dr. Bakker and his impact on the field. Yeah, so Dr. Bakker was a part of what we call the dinosaur renaissance. So for a long, long time, my childhood included and probably most of your uh, childhoods as well, we thought of dinosaurs as slow moving, cold blooded, uh, giant brutes. So you think of the old paintings where you see like a brontosaurus uh, sticking out of a swamp or a T-Rex dragging its tail and fighting with a tail dragging triceratops. And Dr. Bakker was one of the first to promote the idea that uh, dinosaurs were closely related to birds. Um, and because birds are warm blooded, dinosaurs were also likely to be warm blooded and very active uh, types of animals. 
And since then, those theories have been validated over and over, um, especially the idea that birds are just a surviving type of dinosaur. We now see feathers in many groups of dinosaurs. Many of the features we, we associate with birds are present in multiple lineages of dinosaurs. And so Dr. Bacher, who is a Boulder resident, uh, even to this day, was one of those pivotal fig figures in changing um, the way we think about dinosaurs. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question goes to Gordon Gam. Gordon. Gordon, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself if you're not unmuted, Gordon. Okay, maybe he's having some audio problems. We'll go to the next one, Ben. Go ahead, Ben. <clears throat> Hi, yeah, my question is actually related to that last question. Um, I noticed in your the painting that just got published that you did not have the T-Rex be feathered. And I have read articles about whether or not uh, Tyrannosaurus rexes were feathered animals. And I'm wondering if you can give an explanation on the evidence for or against that. Yeah, that's a, actually a really hot topic in dinosaur paleontology right now, um, whether or not T-Rex itself, because T-Rex is one of the most beloved dinosaurs, uh, at least to, to kids and, and myself, um, because many of the ancestors of T-Rex, a group of dinosaurs called Tyrannosauroids, is known to have feathers. And so we have found feathers on really large Tyrannosaur specimens in China where they fell into a lake and were covered with very fine sediments. Uh, we do have skin impressions from T-Rex fossils. So there are about four or five different examples of T-Rex skin. And none of those examples of skin show evidence of follicles or feather-like structures. And so to this point, uh, we, we, we've been reconstructing T-Rex as mostly unfeathered. Although if you look closely at the reconstruction I showed, um, there are little tiny quills along the back of the neck and down the back. So there might be parts of the, the dinosaur that did have feathers, um, but we do know that patches of the chest and the legs and the neck didn't have feathers based on those discoveries. I was able to unmute, uh, so I can ask my question now, if that's okay. Yeah, go right ahead, Gordon. Yeah, uh, what do we know about how dinosaurs evolved? What, what did they evolve from and, and uh, what kind of animals... Uh, I mean, what, what do you know about uh, how they evolved? Yeah, so dinosaurs show up on the scene right around in the middle of the Triassic period. So about 200 million years ago, or about 245 million years ago, actually. Um, and they show up on the scene when many other groups are also first showing up. So turtles, some of the earliest turtles are from this time period. Um, mammals, so our own lineage, some of our, our oldest ancestors uh, are from this same time period. And early dinosaurs were just a small minor role player in that early ecosystem. So they were uh, chicken sized or goose sized animals. Most of them were carnivores, but what made them unique and able to really invade uh, other ecosystems was probably their metabolism. So they were probably warm blooded like birds today. And they had an arrangement of their legs and their joints that allowed them to move about quite quickly. And so that combination of a fast metabolism and a body that's built to be quick allowed them to really jump as soon as uh, some of those other groups went extinct. So some of those early crocodile line groups went extinct and dinosaurs quickly invaded those roles in the ecosystem and took over the world. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is George Garmany. Go ahead, George. Uh, thank, thank you, Mike. I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, are you hearing me? Yes, we're good. Okay. Uh, Joe, I actually have uh, two totally unrelated questions for you, but thank you so much for, for your talk. Uh, I noticed on your map of the KT boundary, you'd go one little stretch of that uh, red line goes right along I-70. And I wondered whether the KT boundary is visible and noted in, the, uh, in that, uh, that I-70 road cut, uh, because uh, you know, that, that would be an obvious place to go uh, for, for those of us amateurs to go, uh, go look and, and see it. Uh, I, the last time I was there was years ago, and they hadn't invented the KT boundary by then. Uh -huh. I wonder if I can go there and see it. And my other question is also a participatory sort of thing. Looks to me like the people on, on those digs that you have may be volunteers. 
how do we volunteer to become dinosaur diggers with you folks? What a, what a great opportunity. So those are my two questions. Yeah, so to answer your first question, uh, we, we do have places where you can see the KT boundary really well. Most of those are out in the Eastern Plains. But the first place the KT boundary was ever formally recognized was on South Table Mountain. And so just outside of Golden, about halfway up the slopes. So just about the same level as the, some of the equipment from Coors uh, is the KT boundary. And that was first recognized when paleontologists were finding dinosaurs around the base of South Table Mountain and they climbed up some of the ridges and realized dinosaur fossils disappear from the record. And it was only crocodiles and mammals that they could find up there. And so it's actually been designated as a uh, geological historic point, South Table Mountain, as one of the best places and first places that the KT boundary was recognized. It's not a line, you can't go up and stick your finger on the boundary on South Table. And that's because those early Rockies were rising at the time. And so all the sediments were really coarse as you were close to the mountains. So they were coarse uh, gravels and sands and you don't get that fine detail that you get in the Eastern Plains of Colorado, uh, but it is there. So you drive by it every time you drive west on, on I-70 and head up for the road cut. Um, and then, yeah, we work with a huge group of volunteers. So one of the big parts of my research is bringing volunteers out to help dig. And so I cover uh, a lot of the Rocky Mountain West with big bands of volunteers. I have about 100 volunteers who come out with me to do these excavations. And we do things like helicopter fossils and volunteers out to sites. Um, it's a really cool way to, to see parts of the country that you wouldn't normally get to see because we're in really remote backcountry settings. Um, but we also have volunteers work with us in our prep labs and in our collections. So there are opportunities for everybody. Um, so if you're interested in dinosaurs and you want to, to be a part of our program, you can just go on the Denver Museum website and um, find our volunteering page there. And we're hoping, assuming that we're, we're able to get vaccines into people, that we'll be able to have our big volunteer crews back up and running by September, hopefully. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We've got uh, the next question, Bill Anderson, go right ahead. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Uh, I was just curious in looking at your bio, I see that you're doing work in Utah and Colorado and New Mexico, but also far flung locations like Kenya and Madagascar. And I'm curious how you ended up getting involved in those projects in Kenya and Madagascar so far from here when you've got so much going on in your own backyard. Yeah, so I started working in some of these exotic locations, uh, places like Madagascar and East Africa when I was a graduate student. And I was um, mostly based out of the East Coast and it was really easy to get over to places like Madagascar uh, relative to getting out West here. But as soon as I moved out to, uh, to Denver, to the Denver Museum, my focus shifted back to some of these really cool discoveries that have historically been made here in the Rocky Mountain West um, and some of the, the, the new places that hadn't been explored. Um, but it's, it's those areas in Madagascar and Africa that I think are really important to understanding the research here in the Rocky Mountain West because it gives context at a global scale. And so we're looking at the same time periods that T-Rex and Triceratops lived here in the Rocky Mountain West, but we're able to look at how dinosaur ecosystems were changing uh, and perhaps even going extinct at the same time that dinosaurs were going extinct here in the Rocky Mountains. So it gives us a good global context. Okay, very good. Next question is Lynn. Go ahead, Lynn. Hi. Say, Joe, uh, I'm curious. <laughs> Seems like you find the bones that are exposed at the surface. Can you search using some sort of geophysical techniques at depth to find deposits that have bones? So that's that type of technology has been tried and tried and tried over and over by paleontologists because that's the dream. You see it in the first Jurassic Park movie where they go out and they use something called ground penetrating radar where you look for uh, reflections and seismic waves uh, as they hit bones. And that, if you remember that movie, uh, they have a complete raptor skeleton laid out just below the surface. Um, in reality, uh, bones of dinosaurs have become essentially mineralized and turned into rock. And so there's very little difference in contrast between the dinosaur bone and the rock that's holding the dinosaur bone, which means any of that sensing technology hasn't been able to show us any good resolution of what's below ground. Um, I've started to work with a couple of uh, oil and gas 
startups that do this type of technology at a very high resolution. And we're hoping to try that out probably uh, early this year if we're able to get out to the field to see if it's possible to use some of that high precision uh, ground penetrating technology. Uh, I don't have high hopes, but it's possible. Okay, great. Uh, before we go to the next question, I have a question. Uh, you said that there might be a new species. I was just wondering um, who names the, new, the species? I mean, are there rules around it? Uh, the person who, just wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, so a lot of the new dinosaurs we have at the museum, I'm working on describing right now. Uh, my mother doing that myself, or I'm working with uh, various students or research collaborators to name that. Um, one of the dinosaurs that we just got in our collection two weeks ago is an armored dinosaur that was donated uh, from the Big Bend region of Texas. And um, that discoverer has asked to be part of the, the paper naming it. And he offered that we should name it Armadillosaurus uh, because it's an, an armored dinosaur, much like an armadillo. So that's probably what we're gonna go with. So he came up with a cool name there. Okay, I, I like Bradysaurus, but that is a good name too. So <laughs> I see you changed your name on, on the screen. I, well, maybe I did. I'm just trying to plant a seed. So the next question goes to John Sullivan. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, thanks, Mike, and, and thank you, Dr. Surdich. I am curious, uh, since we're on the uh, Jurassic Park theme, did velociraptors roam along the ancestral front range? And if not, where did they roam? Yeah, so Velociraptor is a, a specific type of dinosaur that's currently known from Mongolia in a place called the, the Flaming Cliffs of Mongolia, which, are, which were made famous back in the, the early 1900s by the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, some of the descendants of Velociraptor were able to cross over into North America about 70 million years ago. And we do have Velociraptor type animals, one of them called Akiroraptor, that lived right alongside T-Rex and Triceratops. And so that was a dinosaur that was named about 10 years ago based off of an upper and lower jawbone that were almost identical to the Velociraptor that we know from Mongolia from about 20 million years older than T-Rex. So we had Velociraptor type dinosaurs all around us uh, here in Colorado probably. And we find their teeth here along the front range from this time period as well. Okay, thank you. And, and um, I know we could sit here and talk all day long, uh, but we only have time for one more question. So uh, go ahead, Ruth, with the last question. Oh, actually, I think it's me. Actually, Ruth. I would have well, the question I have is when you find a dinosaur bones and things like that, can, can on private property, can you take those or, you, or they, do they belong to the people who own the property or are there laws saying that you can't take these bones at all? And I'm thinking about the about all the litigation regarding Sue, you know, that the, the, the dinosaur that was found in South Dakota, and there's been all sorts of litigation about who owns it and what happens to it. And does the government say you can't take it out? So how do you, who owns this stuff when you find it? Yeah, so you've touched on a, one of the raw nerves of paleontology, Rich. Um, here in the United States, we differ from most other countries in the world where um, any surface fossils, any fossils that were found on the property, belong to the property owner. And so uh, there is a thriving economy for dinosaur fossils found on private land. Sue was one of those fossils that was dug up by what we call a commercial collecting group, and they intended to sell Sue. Um, it went through the courts because the, the land ownership was actually much more complicated. It ended up reverting back to the private landowner and they sold Sue at an auction uh, in 1993, I believe. And it, was, it ended up being purchased by Disney and uh, McDonald's, but fortunately they immediately donated the specimen to the Field Museum in Chicago. So it ended up coming back into the, the public realm. There are many, many other fossils that disappear every day, every week into private hands. In fact, just about a month and a half ago, a similar dinosaur, one named Stan, which is a T-Rex from, uh, from the Dakotas, was just sold at a whopping $37 million. Sue sold for about $8 million. So the price of dinosaurs continues to climb. 
And what that means in the Rocky Mountain West is that uh, academic paleontologists, um, so paleontologists with universities and museums, have effectively been shut out of private property. So in order to dig on private property, uh, landowners up in dinosaur country are now asking for uh, tons of money to access their property and also uh, proceeds from any sales of the fossils. So we're, we've essentially, over the last month or two, been shut out of any of the work that we were doing on private land. Luckily, here in the Rocky Mountain West, there's a ton of public land, and a lot of those fossils that we're discovering on public land will always stay in the public realm. So the Thornton Torosaurus was found on state property that belongs to the state of Colorado. It's held in trust at the Denver Museum, but it belongs to the people of Colorado. Um, a lot of the work I do in New Mexico and Utah is on BLM land, so federal land, and those fossils belong to the U.S. federal government, again, just held in trust. So there are ways around it, but we've been effectively shut out of half of the rocks from the Rocky Mountains. Okay, thank you. Now, it's my understanding, uh, Joe, that you're going to stick around for the rest of the meeting. Is that right? About 15 or 20 minutes, and you'll make yourself available if uh, people want to stay afterwards, and you'll answer questions. Is that right? Yeah, I don't absolutely. I promise you something. To to stay around, yeah. Okay, great, wonderful. I, sorry, I hope I didn't put you in a spot, but that's what they told me. So uh, thank you for confirming that, Joe. Uh, Bill Anderson, you have something you'd like to say? Yes, uh, Joe, I get the privilege of, uh, of thanking you on behalf of our club for coming to speak to us today. I think we all turn into children when we get to hear about dinosaurs. Uh, science talks are some of our favorite talks at the club and today was no exception. It was fantastic. Um, so polio has been a major project for Rotary International for many years. Um, since 1988, um, along with our partners, Rotary has reduced the number of cases by 99.9%. .9%. Just this past August, Africa was declared free of wild polio virus, and only two countries still have, uh, have polio, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we're working very hard to try to eliminate there, along with our partners, uh, on your behalf to thank you for speaking today, we'll be donating 100 doses of the polio vaccine. Uh, so thank you very much, Joe, for coming and speaking with us today. Well, that's amazing. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate all that Rotary has done. Like I said at the beginning, Rotary is really, really close to my heart for the work that they've done. Uh, for us helping communities in Madagascar as well. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Joe. I'm really excited to learn that the state fossil is a stegosaurus. So that's something new I learned today. And then I'm um, questioning whether I should go dig up my backyard, but <laughs> really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. I have a question, Dr. Joe. Go right ahead, Cassidy. It's, uh, do you, do you like the Jurassic Park movies? Does that make your life easier or does it make your life harder? Like, I love them, but uh, I used to uh, be a trial attorney. So I know things like CSI made my life harder. So I was just wondering. Yeah, I, I like the dinosaur movies of the Jurassic World. The, the latest incarnation is a great form of monster escapism. Um, but I think the first in the series, so the original Jurassic Park from 1993, was uh, for a lot of paleontologists life changing. We point to that as one of the reasons we wanted to be dinosaur paleontologists. And in a lot of ways, it brought that dinosaur revolution that I talked about, that dinosaur renaissance, to the public, uh, to the public eye for the first time. So that was the first film that depicted dinosaurs as uh, fast moving, intelligent animals, rather than that old. Um, old view of them being slow. So I really appreciate what Jurassic Park has done. And it does provide uh, a way that the public engages with our science. And uh, we're so dependent on donations to do a lot of work that it helps, helps us keep paleontology in front of the public and um, keeps people excited about dinosaurs. And uh, some of them even donate to help get us out digging more. So it, it's really helpful in that way. <laughs> That's awesome. So I actually have two questions. The first one is related to Cassidy's question. Now, I've seen Jurassic 1, 2, and 3 in the world. 
which is sort of like a bachelor's, master's, and after. So do we get to call ourselves doctors in paleontology? Have we seen all the movies? Is yeah, that I think true? if you've seen all five, then I think that that is qualifying. Oh, I didn't know there were five. Well, I'm really close then. So then <laughs> I'll be Dr. Brady Soros. My real question is how technology, I mean, before you had the physical structure and you were probably trying to fit it together, like a jigsaw puzzle. And I was yeah. wondering if with technology, do you scan it and then it goes into a database and then others are from around the world and then they try to fit it electronically like a jigsaw puzzle? Yeah, that's a huge part of what we do now is, is using CT uh, scanning technology, just hospital grade, but also engineering grade for small things. Um, we're able to look inside fossils. We can look at the bone tissue. We can look at the brain cavities and nerve pathways. And it's a really great way to share fossils. In the old ways, like you said, we used to physically cast and um, share casts of specimens, but now we can just send a 3D PDF to our colleagues on the other side of the world and they can spin a fossil around and look at it that way. Okay, great, thank you. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to interject some. When I, my kids were young, uh, my daughters, I told them that they should probably marry a, a paleontologist or a gerontologist because the older you get, the more interested your husband will be in you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a good, good person to know. <laughs> in fact, our... At least for my PhD, I worked on human anatomy. I had taught in a medical school. So my PhD is in human, human anatomy. So I really like the old bones. Very yeah. good. So um, why don't, if you've got a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll just kind of do a free for all here versus uh, more moderated with, uh, with the chat. So uh, if someone would like to go with the first question or well, I guess the third or fourth one, <laughs> go yeah. ahead, John. This is John. Uh, I think it's accepted determinedly accepted that the reason the dinosaurs were extinct, became extinct, was because the meteor struck the earth and all the dust and the other debris cooled the earth. Is that still the accepted theory of how the dinosaur became extinct? Yeah, so the, the extinction of the dinosaurs has been a hot topic for the last 40 years, trying to understand exactly how and why dinosaurs went extinct, but also why things didn't go extinct. So why certain groups of animals survived. Um, I think the scientific community still largely agrees that it was the asteroid impact and, and the data for that has only grown. There's still a subset of paleontologists that think that dinosaurs were already on their way out. So they were in decline uh, when the meteor hit and um, probably would have gone extinct anyway. And that's why the work that we're doing around the world is so important. So global perspectives on the extinction are the only way that we can really test these different ideas. Um, and that's because the asteroid hit North America. So we know that the asteroid hit uh, just off the Yucatan Peninsula at an angle that essentially lit North America on fire. And the best record of dinosaur evolution from that time period is from North America. So we really need to get out and find uh, dinosaurs of the same age right before the, the extinction event on the other side of the globe. Dinosaurs that weren't impacted by the asteroid directly, but probably went extinct because of the fallout. Thank you. Great, um, yeah, Marlene's got a question. I was going to go right to you, Marlene, thank you. Okay, um, I have a question. So the science in the movies, Jurassic Park, the DNA reconstruction is, you know, finding it. And now I know you can get DNA out of bone samples and things like that. So is any of that true? Is anybody trying to uh, clone dinosaurs, recreate them? Yeah, so uh, there is an active effort to clone <laughs> recently extinct animals. So things like mammoths and woolly rhinos and some of the ice age animals. When you get over about 50 to 100,000 years um, old, you've lost most of the DNA to be able to reconstruct an animal. So DNA as a molecule has a half-life. Um, it just degrades naturally, even under perfect ideal conditions. Those bonds in the molecule start to, to fail and it, it, gives a, it, it falls apart. And so we don't have a lot of hope in finding intact DNA that's more than 66 million years old. Um, but we do have a way to get at that type of DNA for younger animals. So mammoths were alive as recently as, as 5,000 years ago on some Siberian islands. 
And so looking at some of those permafrost, so frozen animals that are coming out of the ground and reconstructing the DNA of those animals has already been underway. And I bet within the next 15, 20 years, we have uh, cloned mammoths and other Ice Age animals walking, at least uh, at laboratories and zoos. Okay, before I go to the next question, I wanted to um, ask you a question again, Joe. What's the life of the DNA? Could you tell that year again? So like, we, we don't have much DNA, intact DNA after about 50,000 years, but definitely after 100,000 years old, it's all gone. But things that are 10,000 years or less, we have access to those, to okay. those forms of DNA. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Rich and Ruth Urban, you got a question. That's by what I just heard a second ago. And that is that I know that you guys are working on how mammals started right after the dinosaurs went extinct. And what, what are you guys doing in relation to that? And what are you finding out? Because I know that the uh, Denver, that the, the museum is really doing a lot of work with that kind of work regarding the mammals. Yeah, so once dinosaurs disappear from the scene uh, 66 million years ago, um, we have a really amazing record here in the Denver Basin, so along the Front Range of fine scale recovery. So looking at uh, 1,000 to 10,000 year intervals and looking at the mammal record, we can see that mammals really rapidly changed in their body form and their size. And uh, we've been able to correlate that with some of the changes in the plant communities as well. And so that uh, extinction event, the asteroid that hit, essentially uh, caused a continent-wide forest fire. So most of the forests of North America were burned. And the, the trees and the plants that came back were the fast-growing um, flowering plants, the weedy plants, not the big old conifers, the redwoods, things like that. And so one of the first trees that came back and started producing fruit were actually legumes. And so we think that the, the rapid radiation of mammals, uh, the rapid size increase of mammals might have been related to the availability of different types of plant nutrition, um, and that included beans. And so uh, the history of, of our own group mammals recovering after the extinction might be tightly linked with the plant communities that we lived in. Okay, and um, Marcia, you have a comment? Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to thank you for talking about dinosaurs in Colorado. You know, it, it's history can be so vague and far away. And, you know, talking about specific places in Colorado where we've hiked or where we've gone really brings it home and really makes it real. So I really appreciate that. And also I was wondering where the, you, you had a slide of the footprints that was kind of blocked off and I'd want to go there, but I don't remember where you said that was. Yeah, that's an area called Dinosaur Ridge. So it's just uh, outside of Morrison on the on the east side of the hogback from Morrison, north of Morrison. Right. Okay. Um, it's a place that it's got a little museum down at the bottom of the hill and then they'll take you up on, a, on a, either a walking path or on a, a shuttle up to see those. And I'm not sure the shuttle's working now because of COVID, but you can hike or, or ride a bike up to those tracks right off the road, Alameda Parkway. Hey, thanks. Thanks again for bringing it to Colorado. Okay, Meryl Soros has a question. Go ahead, Meryl Soros. Okay, uh, you know, I've got an interest in history, Joe, and um, I'm wondering about the great bone wars of the 19th century uh, with Marsh and Cope going at it. And uh, what was their impact on the field, both positive and negative? Yeah, so that discovery that Arthur Lakes made in 1877 in Golden really was the, the match that ignited what we call the Bone Wars, which was a rush to discover and name the most dinosaurs. And it was particularly a rival, rivalry between two scientists out east, uh, O.C. Marsh, who was at Yale, and uh, Edward Drinker Cope, who was at the, the National Academy of Sciences in Philadelphia. And they sent huge teams out west on the railroads to fill case after case of dinosaur fossils and send them back to the Eastern Museums. And what that did was, first of all, ignite the public's uh, excitement about dinosaurs. That's the first time that dinosaurs in North America uh, really hit the world stage and dinosaur fever swept the country and every museum wanted its own fossils. 
but it also led to something that we still see today, which is local communities trying to keep local finds uh, close to home. And so right around the same time, the Denver Museum decided they need to stick their nose in. And so in the early 1900s, we hired paleontologists to go out and start collecting dinosaurs to keep them in Colorado because there were so many uh, car loads of fossils heading out east that we wanted to keep something at home. And that's something we still see today, wherever we work. Even when I work in Southern Utah, the biggest question is why is the Denver Museum taking our fossils away? Um, and those are things that we have to, to work with local communities to help bring these discoveries back and inspire the next generation. Great. Does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Joe Sertek? I just have a, a quick follow-up question about the rush to get bones to the museums. That's happened, I think, in a lot of different areas. Have you personally ever seen someone try to submit a, a fake dinosaur bone? Yeah, it happens all the time. Um, really? There are publications that are constantly being retracted these days on fossil discoveries um, because they didn't follow proper legal proceedings or they came from private land illegally. Um, I have dealt with people bringing fossils in that they collected on public lands illegally and having to work with them to make sure it comes back into the public realm and it's protected. Um, but we also have on the other side, a really great relationship with some of these commercial collectors. So uh, there is kind of a dichotomy in paleontology between what we call the academics like me and the commercial ones who want to see them sold. But I think there's a lot of room to create relationships where important fossils can be saved for the future. And that's what that Texas dinosaur I talked about, the armored dinosaur, is one of those collaborations with a commercial group where they wanted to see this important fossil preserved for their kids and for the future, rather than go off to somebody's mantle in Dubai. Okay, any questions? Well, can I ask one more question, Dr. Joe? Um, I, I'm curious, where is the oldest dinosaur fossil at this point where was it found and i'm um, you know we sort of think of africa as perhaps the birthplace of humanity i'm curious whether africa is the birthplace of the dinosaurs too africa does have some of the oldest so in parts of tanzania some of the earliest dinosaurs are being found uh, i think the oldest currently is from patagonia from northern patagonia the rocky nook called the ishiguolasta which is in northern argentina um, but we're starting to push that envelope here in the Rocky Mountains too. So Northern New Mexico has some of the first dinosaurs um, and those are coming out of early rocks near Abiqui um, in Northern New Mexico. Okay, last call for questions. So Joe, I just wanna tell you, one of the things I love about Boulder Rotary is we have the opportunity, everyone in our club, to talk to somebody like you, you know, experts and ask these questions. And I mean, just what a gift that is. So um, I just wanna, you know, I think I speak for everybody still on here. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today at Boulder Rotary. Thank you, yeah, Jeff. Thank you guys. The questions were great. All right. Have a wonderful day.